with the 101st update for the Frosthaven Kickstarter released yesterday on Elden Ring release day. I didn't really get a chance to read through it until today, but as a person who has put a lot of hours into Gloomhaven, there are some interesting differences between the games. So there's way too many to cover in one video. There are a lot of differences to how the campaign works, uh, to how creating and retiring characters work. I'll make a separate video for those, but I wanted to make a quick video today to get into the differences in how a scenario plays for somebody who's played Gloomhaven. Uh, some of them are house rules that have become made official. Some of them it is content from Forgotten Circles that's now becoming canon. Uh, and there's also a mix of surprises. So I broke it down into categories of tips, but I want to start breaking it down. Here are 32 surprises in the Frosthaven rulebook for Gloomhaven players. Right off the bat, you get three battle goals, not the normal two. So sometimes it was possible in Gloomhaven to be dealt two absolute stinkers. Maybe it's kill an elite enemy, and maybe it's kill an undamaged enemy in a single attack. Some character classes, just that wasn't their job, and you'd be out of luck for that scenario. With three instead of two, hopefully that's a little less likely to happen. Now, those are still kept secret, which is contrast with personal quests which now the rulebook explicitly calls out that the party can choose to have your personal quest for retirement be public or private. It doesn't have to be a mystery anymore why you have that one party member who insists that everybody else get exhausted before the scenario ends. So the starting item shop is already expanded from what it was in Gloomhaven. I don't have the list of what it will be in Frosthaven, but it includes whatever it has from Frosthaven plus six items from Gloomhaven. Those are item numbers 10, 25, 72, 105, 109, and 116, which is really an eclectic assortment. I thought that might be like the set of the potions or the set of the boots or something sort of basic to get you started. That's really kind of six random items. Another note on items, there are now flip items that have a front and a back side. Uh, Magic the Gathering has been making a lot of those recently, um, but I sort of picture something like a net shooter card where on the front side, sure, you can hit an enemy with a mobilize, but the back side might be something like unloaded net shooter, where you can forego a top action to flip the card back over to the loaded side. Last note on items, you can now officially recover items that haven't used all of their charges yet. So if you have something like an armor that took four hits for you before becoming used, you can now still refresh that from two charges back to zero. You don't have to wait for it to fully get the fourth hit before you're able to recover your armor to get you future value. Let's talk about events. So now road events off the bat are seasonal. There's gonna be two different decks for summer events and winter events. The game is gonna start you off in summer when everything is going relatively okay. So when the weather's warm, I'm assuming things will be a little bit more tame, maybe some animal attacks. And then when winter comes around, I would expect much worse road events. I would expect icy hazards, blizzards, I would expect terrible monsters. Uh, but on the upside, probably no bandit attacks during that terrible weather. Another note on road events. So now instead of just checking whether you have a specific class with you, uh, for example, in the base game, there would be a lot of times when you'd need a scoundrel with you to succeed at something that needed sleight of hand. Uh, the events are now going to check not for class names, but for traits. So one example they gave in the rulebook, the banner spear is marked as persuasive. So I would expect there might be some event where you need to convince an ambush party not to liberate your purses from you. Uh, they said that they updated the old Gloomhaven classes, and I would also expect the Jaws of the Lion classes to have traits so that you can bring those classes into Frosthaven if you want, and they would still be compatible with these events. Uh, they said they put them at a URL, which I'll link below, but I visited that and didn't find them up yet, so that might still be in progress. Scenario setup. The game is going to ship with 138 scenarios in total. Uh, obviously, a whole campaign will not face all of those because doing some of them locks you out of others, and some you may never find. There is going to be now a separate section book for when you have to read or do additional setup during the scenario. I like this one a lot. It seems like a really good design. It makes it so it's impossible to see that, oh, a pack of oozes will spawn when I open the door. Better not open that door this turn. You do have a separate book that has those little passages. So it'll be like, when you open a door, 
go read passage, you know, 22a, and then you'll flip to the other book and just find whatever 22a says. You do do that immediately, even if it interrupts an action. So probably in the case of moving into a new room, that will frequently be the case. You'll move to, have something to read, and then maybe finish the rest of your move for action. The requirements to play a scenario are a little more clear this time. They can be of two forms. They can be campaign stickers. So things like, hey, if you've recovered some artifact that you need. And they can also be travel icons, which we're not sure exactly what those look like yet, but that'll be related to the level of the buildings that you've built up in Frosthaven. It might be like, oh, the scenario is only available to you if the wizard tower is level two or higher, something like that. I don't even know if there's a wizard tower. Last note on scenario setup, this one is kind of a weird ad, but it might end up being one I love. Let me know your thoughts. They're now adding a complexity indicator on all of the scenarios from level one to three. So Jira and Agile Software has now made it to board gaming. That, that doesn't particularly change anything for me. I'll still be doing a scenario, whether it's complexity one, two, or three. But what I can see for my group that likes to gather in person is Sometimes if a scenario would go late, we usually try to do two in a week, but you know, if, if things got late, we might not be willing to start another. That complexity one, if we knew the coming scenario was low complexity, that might tip the scale in forward of hanging out a little longer and playing one more scenario for us. So it could be cool, we'll have to see. Cool, boring section, but nitpicky section. So it's cool in its own way. Let's talk about terrain. So the first cool thing to me is that hazardous terrain scales. The damage it does is one plus your scenario level divided by three rounded up. Um, which I think means that at scenario level one, that would still be two damage and it would scale up from there. There are apparently ways that hazardous terrain can get moved or somehow placed under a figure who is already in a spot. That will not ding them for damage. It only dings you for damage when you enter that spot for the first time. There's a new kind of terrain. They're called ice tiles. If you've played any video game, you'll intuit how these work, kind of like the Mahogany Town Gym in Pokemon Silver. If you step on an ice tile, you will keep sliding in the same direction, either until you get off the ice or until you collide with somebody or something. Um, pretty intuitive there, but the rules actually around it might be a little nitpicky. We'll have to see how common that is. Complicating factors is that enemies will consider that sort of free sliding movement from ice when deciding how to make a path to a character. So it, I could see it complicating focus figuring out while trying to figure out if an enemy has the closest path to you or a different character. Jump, which was never that intuitive to me, um, got a little bit more complicated here now because it turns out you of course can't end your turn on another character or an obstacle when you're doing a jump. You can end your turn in hazardous terrain, in which case you do get hit by the hazardous terrain. But if you end your jump on a difficult terrain, which normally requires two movements to enter, it doesn't require two movements to enter. Also, your jump ending on ice does not slide. So basically, jump ending on hazardous terrain does the hazardous terrain, but ending on difficult terrain or ice does not apply. It's a bit of a mess. That one's tough. There are now wall tiles, just little hexes you can overlay on the board. Um, they're kind of like mega obstacles. Uh, they subdivide a room. Uh, you obviously don't have line of sight from them, but notably you cannot fly through them or jump through them. They actually block jumping in flight. The one thing they don't block is you can teleport through wall tiles. This may have actually been in the Gloomhaven rules, but it didn't come up for me and it was called out really nicely in the Frosthaven rulebook. So I'm calling it out here. Doors cannot be opened with forced movement. You can't control an enemy's action and say, hey, you're gonna go open that door for us while we hang back here in safety. Um, also, they end up being part of neither adjacent room. Once you open a door, they're a corridor, quote unquote, uh, which could affect things if you had an ability that said target every monster in the room with you, for example. My favorite topic now, loot. So there's a loot deck now. When you land on a loot token, it won't necessarily bring you gold. It can be gold, but it could also be a random item in some cases. It could be herbs for potion making, and it could be materials for upgrading the settlement of Frosthaven. You don't know what you're getting at the time that you land on a loot tile. You draw that from a loot deck. If it's an item, you gain that item immediately. 
but everything else you gain from a loot is doled out at the end of a scenario. I don't particularly see why they bothered writing that in. They might as well have just had items come at the end, but here we are. So if you loot an item that you already have one of, there's an interesting rule that you either have to hand it off to another character or immediately sell the item. The rulebook for me wasn't ultra clear whether if they meant just convert it to cash on the spot or if they meant the first time you have the ability to back in Frosthaven, you must sell this and convert it to cash. But I thought that's interesting. If you find your second copy of an item through a loot, you can hand it out to somebody else or you can flip it into cash. And if you gain that random item from a loot, but the random item deck is empty because you're a boss and you've acquired them all, instead that card acts like it had three money tokens on it. This is a big one. Loot is dropped for all enemy monsters, including summons and spawns. No more having to track that ambiguity of whether a monster should be dropping a token when it dies. Everything that is unfriendly to you drops a token when it dies. They specifically call out that character allies don't because I think they didn't want to reward you letting your allies die during combat. Targeting. They called this out, and I need help interpreting it. That a hex is adjacent to itself for purposes of targeting. That one's a little hard to parse, but to me it sounds like if you say had a ranged area of effect attack that hit something like all figures, so that would include yourself, if you targeted that area of effect so that it included yourself, then you would have disadvantage hitting yourself and have to draw two attack modifiers for that. That's how I read it. Let me know if you have other interpretations, but it's weird that they specifically called out that a hex is adjacent to itself for purposes of targeting. Uh, there's a new icon that can show up on some cards. When targeting an area ability, there's going to be blue hexes now to show a hex that an ally must be standing in when you target the attack. I know when they unveiled the starting classes, they kind of showcased Banner Spear as a class who took big advantage of that. I'm curious to see how much it comes up for other classes. Flavorfully, that seems actually a bit strange of a mechanic, um, but it could play out neat. So I think I'll be happy to have that in the game. We'll see how it plays. This is one that was a house rule that later became an optional rule in Gloomhaven Digital, and now it's just official in Frosthaven. If you have a summon and you've killed all the enemies in the room because you're good, normally or previously that summon just wouldn't move because it found no enemy to go attack. Now the summon, if it can't find somebody to attack, just takes a walk back to its summoner to get close to its parent. Here's one more. I threw it in this category because it doesn't belong anywhere else. Objectives, they called out, are not obstacles, but they do count as figures, and they are, of course, occupied hexes. Elements. So there are now elements as prerequisites to actions. In prior Gloomhaven, there would be a card that had some attack, and you could consume an element to make that attack better. In Frosthaven, there are cards where you literally must have those elements consumed to even do any part of the action at all. It's printed in the top left. Could see some situations where you plan to use elements on your turn, but a demon sneaks in and uses the sun element before you had a chance to cast Ray of Brilliance, uh, and you might have to pivot what you're doing that turn. There's also now uh, hybrid mana, so to speak. There are hybrid combined elements. Uh, you'll see something like a fire slash icon either for an infusion or for a consumption that's going to mean choose either of them if it's fire slash ice you can choose fire or ice as the element you can consume same as when you infuse interestingly anytime an enemy does that it's like they're offering you a tiny little menu and letting you choose which of the two elements that they consume or infuse as well because of course ambiguity is always to the party's choice teleport is now officially in the game it was previously just part of forgotten circles uh, it works fully intuitively. It's a way to get from point A to point B uh, that doesn't involve like physically taking each individual step to get there. You can just teleport. It doesn't care about obstacles, walls, slowdown effects on terrain, what have you. Uh, one thing that is worth calling out is that you cannot teleport into an unrevealed room. You can, however, teleport onto the doorway, thusly revealing the room. This is kind of large, but I've wrapped all of the status effects up into one new change. Let's go over all of them. First up is Ward. This is a positive effect. The next time that that character would take damage, it takes half of that damage rounded down. 
That has a counterpart on the negative side, brittle. Next time that that character takes damage when it's brittle, that damage is doubled, and then the brittle is removed. Uh, healing does remove brittle, which is cool. Though I didn't see anything in the rulebook called out against using your short rest repick damage to count as the next damage that you would take. So that could be a real easy way to just take two damage instead of one and relatively painlessly get rid of that brittle and call it a day. This one's really cool. Bane is a new status. You merely adopted the dark. Bane sets an impending 10 damage that will happen to that character at the end of its next turn. Heal does remove Bane. One thing I'll call out is that even though it's 10 full damage and that's very likely to kill a lot of things, the rulebook does call out that killing something via Bane does not count for kill credit for purposes of anything that's tracking who killed what. Next up is Impair. This one's pretty straightforward. It just says you can't use your items. You can't use new ones or trigger effects on items uh, until the end of your next turn. Enemies can never gain this because they don't have items, but also they just explicitly can't. Last one from Forgotten Circles, Regenerate officially made it into Frosthaven base game. Uh, it's sort of like anti-wound. If a character has Regenerate, they will heal one at the start of their turn until the next time they take damage. Uh, notably, if you do have Regenerate and Wound, that doesn't innately cancel itself out, but on that character's next turn, the Regenerate triggers first. So it heals the character one, which then effectively removes their wound, and the wound is gone and doesn't even take that turn. Advantage and disadvantage are fixed, sort of, with how they work with rolling modifiers. So without rolling modifiers, advantage and disadvantage are sort of straightforward. You draw two cards, pick the better one if you have advantage, and pick the worse one if you had disadvantage anytime you're doing an attack. With rolling modifiers, in the Gloomhaven rules, they were so wacky, it's not even worth bothering reciting them here. Also, I would probably get them wrong. In Frosthaven, here's what they do. For advantage, you draw one card, and suppose that has a rolling modifier. You continue drawing until you draw a card that doesn't have a rolling modifier. So now you have essentially a stack A with one terminal card. Then you draw one more card, and if that had a rolling modifier on that next card you draw, you ignore that rolling modifier and treat it as though it didn't have a rolling modifier. So for advantage then, what you can choose is you get that whole stack of initial rolling modifiers, and then you get your choice of applying either that first terminal card that you got, or that second one that you drew, whether or not that had a rolling modifier on it that you're ignoring. That's your advantage attack. For disadvantage, it's essentially the same way, except you ignore all the rollings. So you draw some amount of rolling modifiers, say so you got a rolling modifier into a rolling modifier into your end cap card A, then you also draw your end cap card B. You just forget all those rolling cards that you drew at initial, and you look at your end cap cards A and B and take the worst of the two, ignoring rolling if your second end cap card had it. Ability cards. There are unskippable parts of action cards now that are marked with a little exclamation point. Uh, one thing they call that where you might see that is the Bone Shaper, new starting class. Some of their summon abilities just as a penalty slash payment, they have you hit yourself for two damage. And while you can normally choose to ignore certain parts of actions, they call out, of course, with a little exclamation point that, no, you're not avoiding hitting yourself for two damage if you're summoning a skeleton. Come on. Uh, this one's tiny but flavorful, and I just love it. Uh, monster ability cards now have thematic names. So formerly, I would try and tell a story with what the card said. There would be a stone golem who's normally a melee enemy, but he would be doing a, a ranged attack, a powerful ranged attack, and then it would hurt itself for two damage. And so the story I had to tell myself was like, hey, like that stone golem is literally throwing a piece of its arm at us. Like that's why it's suffering the damage at the end of the turn. Um, but now with thematic card names on the monster ability cards, it'll be something like throw arm, and it'll sort of be a little bit more clear role-playing wise what's actually happening there. I just love that change. It's really cool. It tells us a good story in the board game. Kill credit. Kill credit does not apply if you get a kill through wound or through bane or if another monster kills a monster 
or if a monster voluntarily, that is, you didn't tell it to do that, steps on something ouchy, like hazardous terrain or a trap. Uh, any other kill credit acts fairly and pretty sensibly. Uh, if your summon kills something, you do get that kill credit. You get kill credit for retaliating an enemy to death, and obviously for just punching it, you get that kill credit too. Losing a scenario. If you lose a scenario, you can do two things, right? You can either replay that scenario again immediately, or you can say, no, thank you, go back to Frosthaven. The consequences of that are worth calling out here. So if you choose to go back to Frosthaven, you keep all of the stuff that you gained on that scenario, including all of your loot, all of your experience. If you want to retry the scenario, you keep all of the stuff that you got, except your non-gold resources for loot cards. So if you had been picking up, say, a bunch of building materials or herbs, you do not keep those if you mean to retry a scenario. Uh, that's clear that the designers wanted to sort of limit the amount of resources you can get before hoofing it back to Frosthaven. Um, they sort of tied one ability to one chance to gain those resources with one running of the outpost phase to guarantee that you can't just kind of lose a bunch of scenarios and end up way farther than you should be coming back with like a truckload of wood and like a whole satchel full of herbs. This last one I saved for last. It's a small quality of life update, but it's one that really makes me smile. In Gloomhaven, there are two colors of standees for monsters. There's white for normal monsters and yellow for elite monsters. Boss monsters would spawn and my group would generally put them in the yellow stands because, you know, elite enemies were the more dangerous ones. But a boss enemy is not an elite enemy. It's also not a normal enemy. So now there are red plastic standees to put the boss cardboard in to clarify both that they're really dangerous because red is that color of danger and blah, but also to differentiate them from the other enemy types because they're neither normal or elite. Uh, those red stands are also not just for bosses. So we're going to have named enemies, um, which should just be like special strong versions of a regular enemy. I can I can imagine like a quest to go hunt this like special extra strong like Algox guard who's been causing problems. And his name is like Old White Eyes. And he has like a special scenario. He has like a whole throne room and he has, you know, like a little special red stand to go along with that as well. I think that's just really cool. I think that the named monsters are really cool, but I also think that they gave the red stand to help sort of differentiate the really powerful enemies too. And that's all for now. Those were 32 surprises in the Frosthaven rulebook for Gloomhaven players. Some of those were not explicitly new stuff, uh, like the door thing, but almost all of it was. Stay tuned for more Gloomhaven content and Frosthaven content as it becomes available. I'm going to have another video coming soon where I actually take a look at the rest of the Frosthaven rulebook. Look at the things like the new scenario retirement rules, look at the inspiration mechanic. And then this may be a third video where we look at how the building of the city works. It's probably on rock and roll, spoiler. I stream Gloomhaven Digital over on Twitch on Friday evenings, usually a little bit late. Be sure to subscribe and I would appreciate any likes. Thanks very much.